if you are so aligned with your identity and you're fully in relationship with that and you have a lifestyle that reinforces and and supports that like a stream running through nothing can get stagnant everything is in continual flow G'day guys and welcome to Finding Space. Like you, I'm a seeker of wisdom, a pursuer of truth, bottomless knowing. I search deeply for the depths of what makes up this dance that we display in our lives, both personal and day to day. During my search, it has become clear to me that this wisdom I seek is held by those who came long before I did. It sits within those who walked this land thousands of generations before I did. And yet this wisdom sits within me also. In fact, it sits within all of us. And through my journey toward better health, it's also become clear that the way away from disease is often a way back to how things were. In a time when local fellow roamed these shores and harvested these trees. Only now is modern culture starting to recognise the insights held within the Aboriginal communities of not just Australia, but the world. And today, I'm lucky enough to share with you a conversation with one wise fella. A local fella with roots deep in Australian Aboriginal culture. Today, I'm speaking with John Damarakad. Jandamara is a Yorta Yorta and Jar Jar Warung descendant, is an Aboriginal spokesperson and an artist. Jandamara has been a finalist in the Australian Archibald Art Prize and was the first and only Aboriginal artist in over a hundred years commissioned to do a painting for Parliament House of the first ever Aboriginal woman and Senator Nova Paris. In this episode, we cover a lot of ground which is why this interview crosses two episodes, the next being released shortly. Jandamara speaks in beautiful metaphor, poetry, and calm, with wisdom shining so brightly, not just through his words spoken, but also the gaps and the space between those words. For this episode and the following episode, I really encourage you to walk through nature whilst listening. Allow yourself to flow with our flow as we speak and connect with country. I've intentionally left this conversation unedited, leaving the pauses between sections in there because it felt the best way to honour and respect the gravity of this conversation. When we talk about connecting with country, we need to slow down. So I encourage you to do that. In this conversation, we discuss acknowledgement of country and what that actually means. We discuss its importance even when stemming from hollow intention. We discuss connecting with country and how you can implement a deeper connection with your land, wherever you live. We talked about the trauma that sits within many Australian Aboriginals and Jandamara's own experience in dealing with that trauma so he doesn't pass it on to his children. We discuss deep listening and what it really means to listen to the land and have an intimate relationship with it. And it all starts off with a conversation around natural birthing and presence. But aside from what we spoke about, listen to what sits behind the words. It's a beauty and a story of great depth. Like you, I'm a seeker of wisdom. And in this interview, I could not escape the torrent of wisdom which flowed. And so I give you Chandamara Kad. Yeah, what a beautiful space for your beautiful partner to be birthing in, yeah. Yeah, man. It's a trip. Both my girls were born at home in the bedroom, so I love it. Yeah, they, we kept the umbilical cord on both of them, let it fall off naturally, you know. We're doing the same. Yeah, nice smoking and yep. connection with country. How long did it take? for the umbilical cord to come off? About three days it started to get really dry, you know, well, within the two days, but then I think it was about five, maybe six days it yep. was off and it just 
naturally comes off, you know. You know. Yeah. I mean, each to their own. Some people cut it, but we just felt like that's cutting something that's that connection still to that placenta, mm. still feeding after they've come out, but also connection to the mama, mm. connection to all of that. So, mm. yeah, amazing. Just, uh, you know, in in that, and maybe we, you know, that comes into our conversation, those beautiful things that are so changed and disrupted, you know, the natural birthing process and taking time as opposed to got to snip it, got to get it done, got to move on, mm. life is happening, you know, this child's got to start severing its umbilical cord as quick as possible and grow up. Yeah, exactly. Cutting its connection with what's just kept it alive for the previous nine months, its yes. connection with source, That's right. you know, its connection with mum. It's funny sometimes well, from my experience, people seem to need some science-based articles to start to understand something which actually, if we just think about, makes sense anyway. You know, I read recently that um, within the first 60 seconds of being born, um, if you cut the cord, the baby's iron stores will be like, it was like 40% less than if yeah. you just wait for just a minute, right? And... It's like, well, of course, it's still going to be getting nutrients and oxygen and, and things from the umbilical cord and from the placenta. I mean, that's what's just kept it alive. And mm. and here we go. We just cut it quick, get them out. You know, does that suit the baby? No, it suits the hospital. That's right. You know. And it suits the system because um, in many ways, you know, that system, as much as it is what it is, it's designed to get everyone on a treadmill to – you know, serve the economic drive of all of that and, you know, everything from being born through to even passing away, all the ceremonies, all the sacredness is all being fragmented and uh, diluted so much now that, you know, people don't recognise them anymore but they yearn for them. They yearn to have those relationships and connections and there are many individuals and collectives bringing those ceremonies back, not just in a specific, you know, lineal expression, but in a universal way going, these things are what life is about. Otherwise, we're just surviving mm. rather than actually living and thriving mm. as we were designed to. You're right. There is such a yearning for that kind of experience, you know, just, just on the weekend just passed, as you know, we're having a baby very soon, you know, in like three yeah, weeks. And, your way. Yeah. And we are lucky enough and blessed to some of our amazing friends up here created these rite of passage experiences for both Kristen and myself and yes. us as the men went away and yes. did some things, you know, um, just for the day. Um, and the women were in their own space. They were actually in here um, doing some amazing things with Kristen. And for me, that was such a such a treat having – I didn't even know something like that existed. I only found out about like the Rite of Passage Institute a few weeks ago, mm. right? And these rites of passage are lost across all cultures, you know. Yes. And to go through and just, I guess, get a taste – of what's involved in something like that as you go into fatherhood or as you um, go into adulthood or, you know, become an elder perhaps. Uh, you can probably talk a lot more to that than I can, but just to get a taste of what that is and the depth of those experiences, there is such a yearning for that. And these things don't really happen in, in the usual culture. And it's the same thing with bringing a baby into the world. You learn about what that actually means and and the current process in the current system and how detached that is from actually what a birthing experience can be and how much power has been taken away from women. Absolutely. You know, the number of women I, I talk to think who think uh, birthing is scary and they fear it. Why is that? Yes. <laughs> right? The, yes. the female body is perfectly designed to birth. Perfect. You know, that baby's coming out. Yes. Right? And yet as soon as you start to get in the system with regard to birth, they, this, the fear starts to be instilled and the, the woman starts to doubt and the, and the male starts to doubt, can we actually do this? I'm not sure. I think we need help. We better go to hospital. Yes. We better be there because that's safe and they know what's best for me when ultimately they really don't. 
That's right. And yeah. their body, woman's body knows. I mean, it's known for millions of years in all the lands and all the cultures, you know. But it, again, it's a reflection of that very thing, even from when young girls are brought up, being ashamed or, or embarrassed of having their their bleeding time. This is not my business to go into and talk about, but talking about the periphery of that. You know, those young girls, when they go walk away together and spend women's business, they're proud of their bodies. They have a relationship with that seasonal understanding that their their body is letting go of a life there, you know. And when they're birthing, they're, they're, they're having an intimate relationship through the whole process, not having to go and work. If they, women choose to work. I don't judge that. It's not, I don't, you know, an observation in that sense of, what seems to present is, you know, they don't have to go to work. They don't have to do all of these things that are part of the distraction or keeping them in a fragmented existence that they don't have that relationship within in the womb, within themselves. I mean, it starts growing up, you know, even as girls are taught that, you know, they're a certain thing to be pretty. They have to be pretty to be loved and accepted and have value in this world. If they're not pretty, then they don't really fit into the world. Even that whole notion then translates, you know, as they grow into their body and not having a real relationship with their body, having a relationship with that thing in their body, and then having a relationship with that birthing process, which, you know, is so sacred. We all come from that. That is... That is the porthole of the divine right there, yet it is one of the most disrespected, Mm. looked at, ugliest, horrible, you know, fearful, get it out, get it out, as you see in movies, squeezing the partner's hand, you idiot, you know, all of this, ah, rather than this this is love embodied right here. I, I am part of the greatest beautiful creation and collaboration right here, right now in this moment. And I, I was invited to be part of it with the girls, my girl's mum, which I felt very honoured, you know, and if I wasn't to be, I would understand that's women's business. But to see those girls come out, the tears were just flowing at how and healing and amazing to see a life created from the ether into this coming out, into this realm you know, collect, this being is coming into this world. You know, the celebrations where the community would gather and welcome this new one to their, adding to the enrichment of their, you know, their their people, mm-hmm. their world, mm-hmm. you know, those things rather than, all right, we've got a baby, got to do what we need to do, get back to work as quick as possible. Yeah. All of these things you know, are a reflection of a system that is very unsustainable. Mm, mm. I heard, uh, I don't know if there's any truth to this because I haven't experienced it myself yet, but someone said to me, they said, Alex, that the way that you guys go through that first 30 or 40 days is quite metaphorical for the rest of the life for baby and for you guys. And I can kind of understand that, you know, if a baby's out and it's like, all right, cool, what's next? Moving yes, on, yes. you know, it kind of, you miss the whole specialness and <laughs> <laughs> everything that comes with that, you know. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's, it's funny, but, you know, in a deeper sense, it's, it's not. But, you know, you just laugh at how comical it could mm. be in, in an abstract kind of way. So, wow. And, and as I was sharing, as we took a little walk around your property, which I'm grateful for. Um, you know, you're not, you're shifting from purely surviving to living life. You're not truly living when life is about getting from A to B Mm. continually. The moment has never existed. And you think of how many people live on this planet, how many have actually had an intimate relationship with that moment? How many people have had an intimate relationship with that tree right outside their door? or that grass, or that little butterfly that comes. You know, where does that moment go? It gets thrown aside as if it's insignificant and it has no bearing. But that is, that is, that is the whole 
of everything right there. That is the purpose of living. You know, we're, we're taught to exist and we're taught to survive and we're taught to navigate a system that, you know, is so, when you open your eyes and you become more and more the observer and witness this, how surreal it really is and mm. that, you know, when you wake up, you also realise that we are co-creators and we are a big part of bringing that that way of living back into our world and offering that foundation for our children, for our children's 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 children. Mm. Um, out mm. here on the coast, right, and this, this for me, this sharing from Gubby Gubby, Kabi Kabi mob, which are the traditional custodians of this area. And when I say custodians, you know, people often mistake it with ownership. That is a concept that is um, that is introduced from a mind of separation, of of unwellness. We call it rama rama, mm-hmm. sickness of the spirit. They only see division. This this leader fish, it guides the young ones to the spawning grounds to repopulate, keeps them safe. You know, make sure they don't get all gobbled up. If they get gobbled up. It breaks million year cycles that has been happening and it takes seven generations to undo that damage. Mm. You know, this is the stuff that for, for just, you know, reference images of using, you know, a way of explaining mainstream Australia, you know, have a certain perspective on things. But having this, the recognition of seeing this fish and this water, when that it takes seven generations to undo the damage that is done when that fish is caught mm. or taken away. Um, sorry, I've just lost my thought, brother. <laughs> it's all good, man. <laughs> what we're adding to in life is continually looking to that that gen- those generations ahead. Mm. And in those generations ahead, everything we do now affects that. Yeah, sorry I've lost that, brother. It's all good, man. I think it's a perfect time, actually. You mentioned uh, we went for a walk around here earlier and it was really nice and I think what would be great to to set us up for the next however long is an acknowledgement of country. Yeah. And um, I've yet to meet someone who would be in a better position to do that than yourself. Yeah, thank you. So... In doing acknowledgement, acknowledgement, as you know, anyone can do acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're on. No one owns the ocean, the stars, the trees, the dirt. We all belong to that. And in that belonging, we have a a custodial responsibility and something that um, we get to realise over time, as I said, adds to and the enrichment of all of us. Um, Gabi Gabi, Kabi Kabi people have lived on, walked on, held ceremony here for thousands of generations and living in homeostatic balance with their surroundings, that custodial responsibility, understanding that everything is in collaboration and that sense of ownership that comes. Um, no one owns these things, we belong to it. In looking after these things, we acknowledge that those that have footprints here for thousands of generations are the footprints that we all walk in together. So acknowledging those traditional mob, Mm. the ancestors and the elders past, present and emerging as we sit here and share today on this land, this beautiful land that we walk on and sit on right now. Mm. There's hundreds, in fact, sometimes thousands of people listening to each of these episodes and I encourage everyone listening right now to just take a moment and acknowledge the land that they're on too, right? And that could be in a car, it it could be in a sauna, (laughs) right? (laughs) Wherever, wherever they are, um, just having that respect and and just giving it a thought. I have a question for you. I'm really curious. Um, One thing that and I could be completely wrong in this thought here, but one thing that quite bothers me, in fact, is um, I'm lucky enough to fly around the country a fair bit. And when I when, now when we land in a new place, 
the airlines make a brief acknowledgement of country. Yes. And I just can't help but think they're just ticking a box. And in some ways to me, it almost feels insulting. But I'm open to be corrected on that and I'm curious to hear your thoughts because in some ways I can also see the beauty in that, that at least there's some recognition. Um, but I also can't help but think it's just a bit of a bit of a face and something they feel that they need to do. I'm curious to your thoughts on that. And, and this whole acknowledgement of country thing is um, there's such depth to it, but I think that can quite easily be overlooked. And when I hear it coming up more and more, I see the beauty in it, but I also see like, do those people making those acknowledgements really understand the depth of what they're saying and the depth of the trauma that there is yeah. in this culture here in Australia? Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, it's interesting, hey, because um, some people will attend a, a traditional mob ceremony or dance or sharing or welcome or acknowledgement, and what they see on the outside is some people painted up, a little bit of dance, and often they'll be like, oh, nice dance, Aborigine. <laughs> right. Oh, it's so good. Mm. And what they're not seeing, like a finger pointing to the moon, is an invitation to their very humanity, you know, mm. their very connection or relationship to their own spirit. Mm. And, you know, it, it in, in traditional times they never did acknowledgement or, or welcome or they did a welcome, but it wasn't like you have today, mm. you know. But these things have come about in a more contemporary time so that people get an invitation into the deepness of what it really is. It's like um, never had words for thank you, never had words like gratitude or mm. you lived in that space. That mm. space was a natural state. But these words come about so that you can invite people to understand what that state is. It's mm. merely a finger pointing to the moon. And as much as it can be and is quite tokenistic at times, used by a lot of places or organizations, it's still, I feel in some way, even if it can be the most emptiest thing that they've just done because they've been told that's what to do, at least those people who hear it or listen to it may get a little bit of a trickle of something that invites them to go, oh, they said something about Aboriginal people. Mm. For a long time on this land, Aboriginal people have been seen in a very negative light. You know, the propaganda that's put forth, they're a backward race of savages, drinking, fighting, you know, uh, human stains on the earth mm. and those things, mm. you know, which I think is changing greatly mm. these days when I think collectively people are waking up to see and realise their own relationship with all of these things that mob have lived with for thousands of years and held very sacred and dear. Um, so, you know, with an acknowledgement of country, it is about intention behind it. But even with the most emptiest of intention, I think even saying those words, as those words hold power, it reaches some people and probably gets them to go and it probably connects with another story somewhere else, hopefully to invite people to come back to their own spirit on that journey I think we're all on in varying degrees as the human collective and individuals coming back to that that story of we, mm. not me and mine. Mm. Yeah, it, it kind of talks to that piece about separation, you know, yeah. and it starts right from birth a lot of the time, you know, and then as we develop and we start to see others separate to us and us separate to land, you know, but you walk through the land and you realise actually I am the land and the land is me. Yes. You know, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, about this idea of like ownership you can't own land. <laughs> yes. We are the land, <laughs> you know. It's kind of trivial to think that we could own it because we have a piece of paper that says so. Yes. You know. But we, again, we've had influences from birth that, you know, like the birthing process we talked about, that aspect. We've had influences from birth that tell us otherwise mm. and many of us have had to 
um, awaken to that that deception, that lie. I mean, how does a fish say it owns water? You know, if you imagine in a tree, there's a bird with a nest and it's holding an auction and there's all these birds gathered <laughs> auctioning its nest. We'd look at that and we'd laugh, right. you know. How crazy, how, in, how insane is that? Mm. But yet that same gaze upon humans is very different and shouldn't that be enough to tell us that we're out of alignment with everything else? You know, every other animal doesn't have a, a sense of ownership they belong to that tree. That tree belongs to them in a way that it isn't an ownership. It's more of a relationship and understanding that, you know, even in the, in the Western format, they have science. You can take that water and that fish and see that they're separate, you know, but yeah, try and separate them. That's the reality of it. We're trying to separate ourselves from who we are. So we get more and more unwell physically, emotionally, mentally, psychically, you know, can it not be? You know, if you are if you are so aligned with your identity and you're fully in relationship with that and you have a lifestyle that reinforces and and supports that like a stream running through, nothing can get stagnant. Everything is in continual flow. It is cleaning out, rejuvenating, nourishing every cell of your being, of your spirit, of your emotional well-being. There'll be no need for jails, no need for statistics on suicide, no need for hospitals, maybe for emergencies. You know, you break a leg. But even then, listening, go lay down by that river. That bone can heal. You know, no need for these things that we have systems and industries and whole realms now created around the simplicity of that coming back to listen deeply to our spirit and remember that we are not separate. We are not, even this word of separation, we have to think about it and it has all these meanings. But when you live more and more understanding that you are inseparable, you know, like the tails and the heads of a coin. Yes, there's a dance there, but they are inseparable as one, one thing. And you start to realign. Otherwise, we become that stagnant river and we separate in a veil, veils, many veils over. We become separate. We create this illusion of separateness that causes so much trauma that is dis-ease, discomfort in the body, emotions, mentally and psychically. So it becomes a stagnant river then. And in that stagnicity, you know, we, we, we start to, yeah, die. We are, we are walking dead. We become a zombie. Mm. Disease proliferates, yeah. takes hold. And what do you know? We have the highest rates of chronic disease ever. Oh. <laughs> Diseases that didn't exist 100 years ago. That's right. <laughs> and even in, if you go back, you know, there's even records and uh, written things back in the 1920s and 30s by certain doctors and people who really went out and explored, went, you know, to different cultures all over the world and the Aboriginal people here. Mm. They had no known tooth decay. There was no known sickness. There was no known colds or flus. Again, no jails. Mm. You know, they had a strong adherence to this natural law, L-O-R-E. And it wasn't a – when we think of law here, we think it brings up fear. Mm. I've done something wrong, I'm in trouble. Yeah, you break that law, L-O-R-E, there are consequences, strong consequences, but it's a law of love. It's a law of – unconditional love of self, of others, of our environment, mm. its relationship, its understanding on the deepest, truest sense, more intimate than the breath, that what we gaze upon externally, what we touch and smell is self. And we're in continual loving servitude to that. And in that loving servitude, we are nourished beyond what we can mentally understand. The actual mental process has overtaken that, that core intuitive understanding and knowing. 
and that has created the veil between that that flowing river. It becomes rocks that we've put up over time to block ourselves from flowing from that side of the stream to the other side. Mm. But when we start to undo those rocks, we start to realise that we've been living in a mental prison cell, looking outside of those prison bars and perceiving a reality through concepts as opposed to being truly in the moment. You know, and that's where this, I say it's a mentality, the mentality that reached these shores 238 years ago because it, it was a mentality that was doing the same thing to the shores from whence it came. It wanted to sever and disrupt what it saw here and demonise because it saw a sovereign people who were living without need of authority, without need of permission, without need of some centralised controlling aspect that could determine how people were to live or exist. People, like our mob, say for my mother's people, Yorta Yorta, they, they were matriarchically guided. So the women decided how and when and where, you know, we moved to, when resources, we would move to another area and let that replenish a little bit more. All these beautiful systems we had in place, the eel traps, eel farming. Mm. But that wasn't decided because the women were more. That was decided because the women were in servitude in a loving way to the rest of the tribe, the mob, and they would be the ones that would listen, that would govern and sit and decide, right, this is what we all decide on, let's move this way, you know. And again, everything was at that part of that river, that understanding that no one is above, no one is more. And if someone stands in that position, they stand in that position because they're pulling everyone up to stand with them and walk together. So these, these, these beautiful ways were often demonized. And that mentality that I see and feel as sitting with many elders who share the same sentiments that came here, that was the true virus. That was the true disease because it was the disease of separation. Mm. It, it didn't want or it didn't seem to see the value in connecting. It didn't seem to see the value. It saw that backward race of savages who didn't invent a wheel, but that mentality that was here said, you know, so why do I need to invent a wheel so that I can wheelbarrow all my rocks up to build a house and I can chop down the trees and you know, use my horse and cart or something to, to take all the wood up to build a house so I could sit and sit on a deck and look out over the water when I can just sit under this tree right here under the stars, my roof, and I can look out over that water and enjoy life in its abundance as it is right now. In some ways, the way that they worked and interacted with each other they were the wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Was there some sort of working in that way? I, I, I'm really curious about ancient tribes and communities and was there a particular size of mob that worked? How, like how did that proliferate? And obviously there were tribes in different areas and things, but yeah. was there any sort of understanding of of size and how they come together or was that also just missing the point and it's just we come together as a unit and in that in in that case you know the um the females the women decide on hey we've got to leave these trees replenish for a bit or we've eaten the eels here let's move over here or through that deep listening perhaps they're they're, they're seeing that it's time to move on or time to stay whatever that might be are there were there any sort of I guess, fundamental things which made up a successful mob or am I missing the point? Oh, no, brother. And when you say that deep listening, I appreciate you sharing that because that, 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 that is at the core of it all. And, you know, I, I, I can't speak for all of mob. There was over 500 or more even tribal areas. Mm. And you think in Europe, you know, you go from France to Turkey to Germany, how vastly different... Like, you know, in here, and 
I don't believe it. it's deliberate, just people don't know. They think there's Aboriginal people. Yeah, and that's a broad term, but there's so many different mob, different kinship law, kinship meaning family way, you know, and a lot of it was, it was an extension to the animals, the trees, the stars, the dirt. That was all family. It was not seen as something, as we just talked about a little bit earlier, separate. It was all part of it. Mm. Um, so, you know, in that deep listening, whether it was matriarchally or patriarchically guided or orchestrated, it was all from that deep listening. Certain animals, you know, if there was a, a certain type, you know, on Manjerabar, I had Brother Josh Walker share in certain areas, it was decided on the type of animals that were there, whether it was more sea animals or the bird animals or certain life forms that decided whether it was patriarchically or matriarchically (laughs) guided. Even in this, I don't have the full understanding or knowledge in my spirit to be able to speak on depth about that. You know, I, I think I've seen my life over many decades now um, sharing that um, I'm a bridge between two worlds mm. and reuniting that bridge and guiding, you know, from both sides, but also guiding to those like Josh Walker, Lyndon Davis, you know, Kerry Neal, you know, the many brothers and sisters that hold that and elders that hold that information to guide people. But even in that understanding that certain, you know, it, it didn't really, I don't think the size of the mob really was the thing. I think it was more that they understood in homeostatic balance that however they got to, like you look at Wiradjuri area along the coast and it probably consumes my Yorta Yorta mob or Daja Warong mob could probably fit in there 20, 30 times, you know, mm. but they all weren't just one. There were different family groups within that. And even within that, they would work in homeostatic balance with one another. Mm. You know, certain language groups coincided with one another with their neighbours and connect in with one another. Mm. And I think it it always centralised or centralised, I don't like using that word, but always <laughs> centred around that deep listening that comes. And in that deep listening, it. You know, it's rather than going in a mental understanding, this is what it is and this is what it isn't, because it can grow and flow and change. You know, when we get a bit of rain and it diverts the river and changes the course of the river, that river can no longer think the way or be the way it was before. It now has to move with it. When a tree grows up to the sunlight and there's a tree branch blocking it, doesn't go, well, that's it, that's the end of my journey, I'm going to. It moves to the side, yet it has to now adjust the way that it accepts light, the way that it, if you know, gets gives out oxygen, all of those things. Mm. So there's so much, and I feel that there's so much that words and thoughts and concepts, as great as they are, can invite. When you go and sit on country, or you go and sit with mob of a certain area. You know, it's not so much what they say, it's the spaces between what they say. And in there is that aspect that is is more intimate than breath. And it is something that aligns with our spirit. And I think that, um, I don't think I feel that there is many aspects of us that are undoing at this time to come back to actually hear that language that is being spoken you know, so many have come up in exhibitions and other things and at different times and said, you know, how did how did mob of the past know what food to eat? How did they know, you know, what was poison and what was not? Mm. And, you know, they go, well, did they eat something and one of them died so everyone learnt from that? And I said, no, what, what I know to be true and understood is there is a language that is continually reaching out to speak to us, mm. whether it be the plants, whether it be the animals, whether it be the trees. But again, on that level of going, this is who you are. Mm. 
You've forgotten to listen to yourself. You've forgotten to listen to this language that you've distracted yourself with all these concepts and thoughts. Come back to it. It's in the wind. It's in the grass. And when you have that relationship, when you have that listening and you actually listen to that grass, it'll speak to you. Mm. When you have a relationship with that tree outside of your your door there, it'll speak to you. It'll show you, it'll guide you in ways that transcend those mental concepts. Mm. Yeah, well, it's the, it's the intimacy with the moment. Right? Intimacy, yes. Being there, right there, listening, opening. Yes. Not just the eyes but the spirit, yeah. This episode is brought to you by Found Space. Australia and New Zealand's premium infrared sauna company. Ready to sauna? Ready to take your health to a higher level? Make your home a place of wellness with Found Space. Visit foundspace.com.au or foundspace.co.nz to learn more. So you've talked about deep listening a little bit. How do we open ourselves up more to be able to listen deeply and what does deep listening really mean to you? I believe we're always connected. We've never not been connected. Mm. But because of the, the trauma of living in such a mental prison scape has um, um, distorted that, mm. that perception of connection and caused so much trauma. I believe it's the letting go and it's painful to let go. And I, I say that as being part of this modern day world as well, navigating a system that even as a child for me was very painful and um, out of harmony with what I was seeking or feeling. Deep listening is true humbleness. Deep listening is sitting or, or not sitting. It doesn't happen in a form, but it is It is surrender, you know, and the concept of surrender is different than surrender. You know, when you die to every moment, when you realize that there is, there is a reality of one person having experience with an external sensory input of everything else, but when you truly surrender and die to the moment, you see with clarity that there is no other here. And in that, there's a humbleness of of receptivity. It is in that window of receptivity that that language, that knowledge, that understanding, that is not about gaining, but it is about immersing oneself in the entirety Talk about that trauma of feeling separate. We have created an illusion that we are a drop separate. But when we remember and allow that immersion of that drop back into the ocean, which it always has been and always will be, never born, never die, the eternal dreaming, when we realize that state, some call it nirvana, some call it you know, uh, 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 enlightenment. We truly realize that we walk tall with everything around us. We are never alone. We are never isolated. We are never disconnected. Mm. We never need to worry anymore. There's no place to go. There's no more striving. That's a mean effort. You want to build something, you want to do something, but it's effort in the effortlessness It is now knowing that you are home and you are truly held and you are truly at peace with everything. Life and death on a physical level become just a light and shadow understanding. Mm. There is nothing gone. There is nothing taken away. You know, that uh, the dreaming that mobs share about and they share in song, they share in ceremony, they share in dance, Again, it's a finger pointing to that moon. Again, it, it's an invitation beyond our little prison cell that we've been passed on to and, mm. and um, built up 
that has kept us believing we are that drop. It is an invitation to remember you are home and it's an invitation to walk tall with the brothers and sisters of that animals, those trees, you know, to understand that nothing just comes into your reality. Anything that is manifest is a physical reflection of that inner reality. Mm. And when we focus that reality with tainted views, we create that reality on a greater level. But Didiri or Gupu Nawal, which is deep listening, is cleaning the veil, cleaning the lens of that what we see through our human experience to see with much greater clarity, again, as we are in beautiful loving servitude of this world in the way that it nourishes us. Um, so deeply, so greatly. Man. <laughs> what beautiful words, wise words. And it's this transmission that to me came through the first time I heard you speak and and just the more I, I learn and understand about Aboriginal culture and, and just traditional culture and not even just Australian but across the globe. Yeah. There's this like what you're sharing, it, it, it's just is, <laughs> it's just a part of life. You know, like yeah. you said, that gratitude wasn't a thing. It just, you were that, yes. you know, and the depth that comes with that is, is really, really beautiful. When we walked around this morning, I, I really noticed that we were just chatting and just you looked at different parts of the land to when I normally have people on the land here. And I'm just curious, like, you know, you're putting your hands in the dirt, you know, and probably thinking, man, Alex needs to get his fucking veggie patch sorted, but I'm getting there. <laughs> you know, you put your hands in the dirt and you were looking up at the sky, you know, and you looked at the treetops and, and you looked around and I'm just really curious at like, your lens and when you walk onto any piece of land, like what are you looking at and what are you feeling for and and what are you listening for in those moments to connect with that piece of land that you're on? Um, I always introduce myself and, you know, not necessarily through words, just feeling that dirt. You know, I put a bit of saliva on my hand and rubbed it in the dirt. Mm. For me, that's an introduction to this place here. I, everywhere we go, we're... we're you know, you walk into someone's house, you introduce yourself, you go, hey, mm. to the people, you know, and you look around at the, the people's things, the roof, the, you know, some people with their own lens will look at the flowers or they'll look at the paintings or, mm. you know, when we're walking in bush, it's, you know, on country, it's the same thing. That That's alive. It's It's living. They're all living there, those trees. I'm looking up at the trees, looking and seeing what animals live in those trees, what is part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking up in the sky, it's looking at the relationship of those leaves to that sky. Mm -hmm. You know, I often look at the bottom of trees and I see the mycelium growing. Mm -hmm. For me, that whole network of connection, it's alive, it's living. In my saliva with the dirt or if I wipe my sweat mm -hmm. with the trees, it's like, no, I'm here, I'm here. My intention is to be here to listen. I'm part of, hello, how are you? I'm here. I'm not here to harm you. I'm not here to take away. Mm -hmm. I'm not here for my ego to, to disrupt. I'm here as part of your healing, part of this healing. Mm -hmm. You know, the perception that I've talked about of that mental scape reality that is part of that, you know, as I say, the mentality that came to these shores came with a view that they were to conquer, they were to, you know, to take the resources of a place rather than that, that gulp in the wild to deeply listen. So, you know, they missed out. They didn't see that. When they looked at a tree, they didn't see apartment blocks for animals. Mm -hmm. When they looked at a tree, they saw furniture, they saw housing. Yeah. You know, worlds apart. I'm not here to say which one's right and which one's wrong. So when you go somewhere, we're, we're not taught or we're not guided, and I feel it's deliberate, you know, and not to deviate off track, but you go to schools and you can learn how to speak French and German, but you don't even get shared how to speak traditional 
native, you know, language which holds a vibration of all of what this is all, the whole spaciousness that cannot even be contained, yet it is part, it is deliberate. I feel it's very deliberate to keep everyone from connecting with their own sovereignty. So when you walk into the bush, walk on country, go to that ocean, go to that stream, that brook, you're saying hello, you're part of it. You're, you're immersing yourself into that atmosphere. And, you know, talking about earlier, how did mob know which thing was poisonous, which thing would heal if they got bitten by something? That's, that's because they communicated continually with the land. They would speak to it. There was a language happening that transcended words. Words might be part of it, but it was a vibration in words that was then reflective of that deeper knowing or understanding and I suppose a lot of this may not even translate into what I'm sharing mm. because it is an experience. It's like you can't, you can't experience something from a separate perspective and you can't understand it truly as it is. All you're doing is looking at a shadow of it. You're looking at that finger going, that's the moon. It, it, it totally is not the moon. The moon shines upon it like it shines upon everything else but it is not that. Mm. So when I walked there, and it was many years and times of, of letting go and that surrender and immersion of getting to know that this isn't just a token gesture of walking in the bush, hi, how are you? Oh, look, yep, serving my journey of being there. But to know that I walk tall. I walk into there at times feeling at times if there was everything removed, all the comforts that we've been um, so-called living, if they were all removed, how would I live here? How would I live and thrive, not just survive, not just, oh, I've got to get through from day to day, but how would I understand and learn this landscape and read it like a sacred text so that I'm part of the whole collaborative relationship and unfolding. And the key is right there in looking at those trees, those animals. Where do they go for water? What do they do? If I have a relationship from them, I see them more. I see them. I see everything that happens as a part of self, as a part of my view, my perspective, my limited perspective of ego, eyesness, can't see any of that. All it sees is what I'm focused on. I just want to track through that bush, get to the other side. And that journey of A to B is a big part of that mental scape, always striving to get to somewhere, always striving to achieve, always striving to um, get over that hump as opposed to know that you are there. This moment is all that exists. Me being with you right here, right now, my children don't exist, nothing exists. I I have such immense love for all of these other things, but this is all that's real. And when you immerse yourself in that spaciousness, that Gopal Nawal, you get to understand that those trees, those animals, that grass, that dirt, it is your home right now. It is your family. And right there and then, that is everything. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because any moment that appears after that, is that moment, mm. and that moment is all that's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you'll be with your kids tonight, I'm yes. sure, and or whenever that is, and then that'll be all that exists yes. in that moment, and I won't exist for you in that moment. Yes. And there's a beauty in that. Yes. Yeah. You'll exist in a sense just quickly in a mental shadow, mm. which, you know, is a beautiful thing. It's part of our human but when we believe that is our ultimate finite definitive reality, that's when I feel we are, for lack of a better expression, in trouble. We're getting towards the end of our time here and what I want to know is how, how do we engage more with Aboriginal culture in Australia? How do we... How do we get it in schools for children to be learning some of the traditional language? How do we make more of a 
prioritize this kind of learning because to me, I'm just a kid from the burbs and this is all, you know, it's, it's obviously more in culture now, as we said, they're talking about acknowledging country on planes. Great. Yes. But I feel like not only have we not even scratched the surface, I think we've barely blown the dust off the surface. How do we get more of this wisdom, which to me is what we've been talking about today. Yeah. <laughs> How do we get more of this out into the open and have more conversations about it and have a deeper understanding about where we've come from here in Australia? I, 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 in some ways I don't know. Um, in many ways I do, but in some ways I don't know. You know, I've spent decades with other beautiful First Nation and non-First Nation mob trying to make this a reality, mm. you know, in a way that isn't about fighting. We're on this wheel where we're continually taught we've got to fight, fight for our rights, and, and, I, and I get it, you know. We, you know, there's a time and place, but I think the time and place now is to wake up. When we wake up, those things become a natural reality. And I believe go globally, especially f for what I see, what has been unfolding over the past, accelerated over the past few years, there is a global awakening and a remembering. These things are a natural part of our, our yearning to feel again. When, when there's a, a, a cyclone, when there's a massive flood, when there's a fire, when there's some kind of natural disaster or even man-made disaster, you see the best of the human spirit come alive. Mm -hmm. You see people let go of all of their shit and just be in that moment. What they see in another person is they see themselves in such a clear reflection. They will jump into a raging torrent to save someone they would never even talk mm -hmm. to in the street. Mm -hmm because they remember who they really are in that relationship. And the more and more we look at ourselves and see that it starts, well, there is no beginning or end, but great origins or aspects of it are within ourselves. What we see of the external world is a reflection of the internal reality. Mm -hmm. And we are all part of, on the human level, the very superficial expression of it all, we are all part of adding to this reality. And when we acknowledge and see the truth within us and delve deeper and immerse ourselves, that starts to come about. But if we talk about it on a purely human level, which is fruitile, <laughs> you know, and I once heard it, it's like trying to iron the surface of the ocean to make it flat. <laughs> Every wave, it is, mm. you know, we often think we got to deal with that wave and that wave and if we deal, but the thing is the undercurrent of it all is where it's really at. But if we were to, it's more and more for people to see the value of what mob, not only of these shores, of all the shores, traditional mob have you know, that knowledge and understanding of whether it's hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years of relationship. You know, if they were to see there's no us and them, yes, when we walk in the forest and we see the kookaburra, the lyrebird, the butcher bird, the magpie, that crow, and we go, wow, what a symphony. But yet we look over at humans and go, that one's wrong, that one's mm -hmm. right. That one should sing like that one. When we can align those back into homeostatic balance, we get to see there's no us and them. There is just we. And when we see that we, that oursness, we start to see that those, those, that language, those ceremonies, they aren't the Aboriginal people's ceremony. They aren't of those people. They are the language of humanity. They are the ceremonies of our very spiritual essence of living. So the value of that then naturally will infiltrate every part of our lives. And these structures that I've struggled with and many struggle with, like this week, you know, I've been working, not this week, I've been working for a few weeks 
with young Aboriginal men um, in a program. And this two days, three days ago, I found out that one of the young men, his younger sister, young teenager, took her life. Mm. This, this is a reality of a lot of Aboriginal people trying to fit into a system so this, their rate of suicide is the highest in the entire world. Mm. Their rate of incarceration is the, the highest in the entire world. The, rate, the lowest life expectancy in the entire world. All a byproduct of this trying to fit into a system that doesn't acknowledge or see that language in school, that culture in school embedded in our society is integral for all of us and especially the existence and the, the continuation of a mob that have been here calling us all back home. Mm. You know, when on a, on, a, on a superficial level you can ask when and why and it can be so painful to feel like your mob is just a stain on society and no one wants to look at it mm. or see it. But then you know in your spirit and you see brothers like yourself, people like yourself that don't see us and them, they see we and they recognise the value. And that in itself is one of the greatest transformers of bringing those things back into our educational facilities that are no, need to turn from a, a stagnant river or stagnant dam into a river again mm. and flow like... Um, I saw a statement this week from Wildings Forest School put up. Children in primary school spend less time on country and in, in nature than prisoners, you know, because now they don't go out and sit on the oval. They don't go and spend a lot of time. They're in classrooms a lot more. Mm. And I can see the, you know, as much as there is more of this world that is uh, – trying to take people away from nature and turn. There is also this other reality that is expanding that more and bringing it into our, mm. our worlds a lot more. Mm. There's more, more yin and more yang. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps than ever before. It seems the division is, yes. is bigger now. But there's more people on, on both sides, it seems. Less people on the fence. A wise man said to me recently, he said, Alex, now is not the time for fence sitting. Yeah. You know, now's the time to to go for what you believe and what you know to be right. Yes. You know, whatever that might be. <laughs> yes. What's right or wrong for everyone is different. <laughs> Even that is a perception, isn't it? Mm. You know, someone goes stealing a loaf of bread is wrong. What if that's to feed your family, you know, and your family's dying of starvation? Does that LAW really, whereas law is a, a flowing river, it doesn't base itself on L-O-R-E as one that's based more on the circumstance, mm. the, the, the moment and how it unfolds in that moment. Mm. Yeah. It's seeing everyone as a brother or a sister, isn't it? Yes. You know, and when you see everyone in that way, in that unity, there is no right or wrong. It just is. Yes. You know, and from that place comes compassion and all, all these beautiful things were spoken about as well. Yeah. That's right. Someone has a dog, someone doesn't have a dog. Who's right and who's wrong there? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to end this and ask you any wise words, but we've just had an hour of wise words. So any words in general, anything you'd like to share with anyone listening right now before we finish up? Take time. Don't believe what the world around us tells us. Go and sit and listen to your own barometer. That's the only true reference point. No, and often it takes a whole life when we lay there and take our last breaths and that truth becomes more and more evident. But take time. Know that you have it all within you and around you, and it never has been not. Don't let anyone or anything 
convince you otherwise. Because it is, there is a trickster energy that takes you in a certain way, but there's also that unconditional love, always a well of that within us that is never, ever not. Chandamara, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, my brother. If people want to find out more about you, if they want to see some of the beautiful art that you create, where can they find you? Uh, people can go um, to jandamarasart.com or they can go onto Facebook or Instagram. Um, and, yeah, they can look at some images and um, see that. Those, those paintings, as with hopefully these words, are, um, yeah, an invitation and um, visual narratives that um, hopefully bring a bit of joy to people and, um, yeah, seeing our relationship and connection. Thanks, my man. Thanks, my brother. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes.